Hi, everybody. This is Austin Call with Fantasy Baseball on Deck. I'm your pal. I'm reliable sometimes. In regards to the last 11 days since I've made my last video, I haven't been super reliable. In all honesty, if I'm going to share some secrets with you, I haven't hardly watched any baseball at all. And most of the updates that I've gotten have been uh, via direct test, text message for my brother. So uh, I've been pretty out of the loop and I uh, don't really feel like a super subject matter expert as of right the second because I was at, I was gone at a wedding. And uh, when the wedding consists of people that you live with, so the two people uh, that got married, I, I'm roommates of. Um, pretty detached from everything and given that it was destination wedding in texas i've been gone and then i get back and all of a sudden there's this big goofy eclipse thing it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity unless i plan on going up to uh, uh north dakota and or montana in 20 years from now when i'll be a whole 48 years old i can't imagine being 48 years old that'd be wild but anywho it's been 11 days since i made my last video what did we cover in the last video i covered uh, I, I i personally watched and took notes across uh, around like 14 hours worth of baseball on opening day and sort of uh, made a video uh, highlighting and describing the, um, the the underlying narratives that existed um, based on what we saw opening day and the importance of winning opening day. And again, some of the underlying context that are uh, a little more apparent now, but we don't have any answers to until we see things happen. So what am I covering today? Uh, specifically, I want to uh, first show off um, be the accountability portion on Fantasy Baseball on Deck. Every other website that you go to with Fantasy Baseball Analysis, they're going to give you a bunch of opinions. They're going to tell you what to think, not how to think, and uh, they're going to move on and never never um, revisit their bad takes per se. Because this is a, um, a league for ESPN head to head. Um, I like to show you kind of my progress so that like, if I'm giving you advice, essentially I can show you what my record is um, and how much I'm scoring compared to my peers to essentially back my, um, my words, back my, back these videos to make sure that like, again, I'm accountable to you and that I'm succeeding as long as you're succeeding. We're succeeding together because I'm following my own advice. Anywho, um, Let's jump into it. Russell wants to join. This is Mr. Cat. Uh, Mr. Cat is maybe a fan of baseball. I do not know. But I will give you some love just for the second. I'm sorry for the YouTube crowd. I do not talk to him very much because I am a very busy man. But into your bed you go. And on to our first uh, thoughts. Uh, other than like after I talk about my accountability portion, which is uh, showing that I'm you know, 2 0 so far in this league, and then 2 0 in my other league, and showing kind of the scoring breakdown of things. I'm then going to talk about um, like 18 different players, batters, and uh, pitchers that I think are going to be significant that are most likely, maybe to most likely uh, available in your league. So we're three minutes and 30 seconds in. Heck yeah, let's do it. So. <clears throat> Um, this first league, holy crap, have I been decimated by injuries and have you been decimated by injuries? Do you play fantasy baseball? Well, if you've been affected by injury, go ahead and call your law form at fantasy baseball on deck. I'll fight for you. You know, those commercials, those local commercials where like some sort of tiger jumps on the screen and like, I'll fight for you or small enough to care, but big enough to win sort of thing. Anyways, um, my team fell completely apart and also in this league. So I'm 2-0, and and there's such thing as coasting, not giving up assets um, when injuries occur if you're ahead. So this will make sense in a, uh, in a little more time. So in this league specifically, the, the independent um, variables that I can focus on are going to be offensively like total bases and then like defensively, meaning pitching, innings pitched, and strikeouts. Total bases, I'm um, seventh. Again, <laughs> the offense has been – struggling to say the least, but I'm um, kind of my, um, my, my guaranteed sort of like um, asset to all of you. And to me, I get, I know that my pitching, like finding pitching that's quality, that's like not necessarily like dominant, dominant, but like less risk averse is always going to set me ahead. So I'm currently second 
in innings pitched with also, again, guys on my I, guys on the IL filling up active spots and not pitching. So, again, these numbers are a little skewed. I should be better across the board. But number two, across the t- like the two things I care about, and then obviously total bases, I'm uh, struggling both because the offense, is, offense isn't producing injuries and just playing without like a fully active roster. And this will make, make sense here in a second. So um, three of my main number one contributors. So Josh Young was number one third baseman when he got hurt. Uh, Royce Lewis uh, started out. He, he played uh, a portion of one game and uh, was two for two with a home run and seven points. So uh, huge Royce Lewis fan. That was somebody that was uh, highlighted in bold green and even a scion sliver of uh, a must draft person. Luis Robert being someone who is a, who is a top, he's a top 10 or top 15 individual uh, producer, individual productivity last season in regards to total bases and stolen bases combined. And he also got hurt when I was gone. And then pitchers that I lost in this league. Oh gosh, I have the burst. I'm sorry. Um, Shane Bieber, number one starting pitcher in all fantasy uh, when I lost him. And then Justin Seal uh, was a, I think my sixth round draft pick, a pretty high investment um, into him. He got hurt in the very first game as well. Nick Lodolo comes back on Saturday finally, but he's been just taking up a bench spot. So meaning like I'm playing a man down um, across, I'm playing a man down across all of my, uh, my games so far, even though we're only two games in, um, I had enough of a lead across my two games so far that I didn't have to like drop any, again, assets. So I was playing, handicapped on purpose, making sure that I wasn't dropping people. And if we go to points for, I'm third in points, but again, this league specifically is, uh, is hurt. So if I place my cap out of the way, sorry, only seven minutes in, we're doing good. And again, as always, I would, I recommend watching this at 1.25 speed. Um, The thoughts are probably a little more coherent with my, breaks and things um and you get through them a little bit quicker so everybody wins anywho um because i just have lost people due to injuries i'm having to like i, I lost both of my third basemen having to start some uh a ragtag group like ryan mcmahon and ryan mountcastle both had to get added i just added tyler um tyler o'neill and will benson as well like weren't guys that i drafted just to fill holes because of injuries and then again, Nick Lodolo finally comes back from um, the IL on Saturday and makes a, his debut with the Reds. And ideally, he won't have like a, a huge, huge pitch restriction. I doubt he's going to get more than like 60 pitches, but I have a lot of faith in him as well. Okay, so that's the accountability part. Number one, number two, let's fly through the second one. I'm also 2-0 and in this league. I just thought I hit – I had the most significant injury across either of my team in this league, but it's just this, this team is, is just set up a little bit better for success. Um, we don't do total bases in this league. We do um, like more of the dependent stats. So, you know, runs, singles, doubles, triples, home runs, RBIs, stolen bases. And that was all the, the other independent thing that we can focus on stolen bases. And I can always make sure that I have a fast and powerful team. And the same thing in this league. Um, if we go to, Home runs, kind of middle of the pack, stolen bases, tied for first. Um, Runs, again, don't have like a ton of like um, top of the order guys. Runs are are really lucky. Like uh, Runs are completely luck, and then RBIs are completely luck. So I don't really want to focus on those. But what I can always guarantee is that our, our, our pitchers are going to be quality guys are earning quality starts for you and um, getting strikeouts while keeping people off the base pass. So innings pitch number one and strikeouts as expected again, number one. So I was probably uh, pretty up uh, tied for a second with wins as well. And then points for number one by 80 points so far after 10 games, essentially. So my goal is to not only finish in first place, but outscore everybody in my league uh, by essentially a thousand points in this league, the way that the scoring works out. And I was actually able to outscore everybody by a thousand points in my other league a couple years ago uh, with standard scoring, which is really hard to do. But um, 
it's I'd, I'd like to then instead score 500 points more uh, than the second place person. So, um, any use again, just being um, transparent about how I'm doing. So, uh, going on to the injuries in my second league uh, again, Josh Young and Royce Royce Lewis. I had <laughs> I had I had these two players essentially across all of my leagues. Really suck. And then Spencer, uh, Spencer Strider being the number one uh, starting pitcher overall in uh, fantasy baseball pre-draft, um, given that Garrett Cole got hurt. I traded Marcus Simeon, Joe Musgrove, and uh, Justin Steele all for uh, Spencer Strider. So essentially I gave away three players, early draft picks for Spencer Strider in return. He throws two games and is out for the year. So, you know, you – uh. <laughs> it's bad luck sometimes. And obviously Shane, Shane Bieber uh, was the number one starting pitcher when he got hurt and is out for the season too. So again, the rest of the, of this video is going to be like, how can we um, sort of, uh, how can we adjust kind of thing? And um, I don't think there's any really adjusting to losing Bieber and Spencer in the same day. I think that I lost them both in the same day. Um, and then as well as like the offensive productivity, that was going to be uh, Luis Robert Jr. and Josh Young uh, is tough too. But uh, what I'm doing now is essentially waiting to see uh, whether Brand Fat and another player come off waivers so I don't have to use my waiver claim to finally switch out Spencer Strider into the um, into the into the major lineup. So this is all boring so far. I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, overall the team's doing like uh, pretty good and it's uh, that's, but that's not what I'm, I'm not here to talk about my t team only. Cause that's not universal. I want to talk about um, what teams or what players are maybe available in your leagues to help you out, given that you might've had similar injuries, or if you just have players that are super like unproductive, um, what are some guys that are still kind of under the radar that you can invest into um, now and early. So going on to the stats of things, Tyler O'Neill getting into okay, it's 12 minutes in. Boston Red Sox are not a playoff team this year. Um, Nick Pavetta, Nick Pavetta actually just got hurt. He's out for the season. Tyler Trevor Story just got hurt. He's going to be out for the season. Um, the The offensive bats for the Boston Red Sox are going to be pretty ragtag, but like the bats that are available and they're playing every day are going to literally play every day. So Tyler O'Neill uh, hit 34 home runs just a couple of years ago. Um, he is a, <laughs> if you've ever seen pictures of him, he's absolutely jacked, big power player, but so far this season and only 28 at bats, he's top 10 in offensive production across all positions. So super hot start. He's averaging 2.5 total bases per hit. So he's averaging a double and a half, almost a triple, uh, per hit with like a 300 average to start the year. Is that sustainable? Absolutely not. 344 average. Like, no, that's not sustainable. But at least so far this season, he's playing between both corner outfield positions um, and batting the free hole every single day. And he's also like the only power, like like power threat option behind Rafael Devers. Rafael Devers is locked into hitting that two hole every single day. So you should expect Tyler O'Neill to play in the prime time. I mean, best spot in the batting order every single day for the Boston Red Sox, and that's a pretty like that's a pretty confident investment given what we've seen so far through the first two, ten games. Now on to uh, Christopher Morel. Christopher Morel is uh, playing every day for the Chicago Cubs in the four hole, and he's playing every day at actually third base. So um, any day now, give these played every day at third base, maybe a couple uh, days at uh, DH through 12 games or something like that, he's going to gain that third base eligibility. So this would be a player, um, if available to me, would have been super helpful given that I lost both third basemen. But uh, averaging a two, a 326 average, he had a grand slam today versus the, uh, the Padres. So um, he was super explosive and productive two years ago when he debuted. And then it very quickly became a situation where they weren't going to make the playoffs. So they decided to just, while he was hitting like 280 at the top of their lineup and eligible across like most positions, um, they just decided that they were going to send him back down to the minors to manipulate his contract and service time so they could keep him longer. 
I understand that from a management perspective, but now it seems like Christopher Morell should play every day and, again, should gain that third base eligibility. So um, that's another valuable piece at, again, 55% owned, most likely, more than likely not available in your league. But if he is, um, that's something to, uh, you know, maybe invest into if it makes sense for your roster. Uh, next is uh, Jake Berger. So Jake Berger is for the, I mean, for the first time last year when he got traded from the White Sox on t- into um, the Miami Marlins system, this was the first year that he would ever had an opportunity to play every single day. So he actually like went to the Marlins. He was a 215 hitter with the, uh, with the White Sox. And then to finish out the year, he was a 300 hitter uh, with the Marlins because the, yeah, the more reps you get, the more consistency you're able to build into. Um, this is his first year that he's playing every single day. He's also hitting in the three hole every single day. He's been getting first, he's been getting reps at first base and third base as well. Nikki Russell for knocking over stuff. Um, he's averaging like he, he's at, a, he's a 261 average last year. He was 250. I expect him to be around 250, 260 hitter, but the important part of or for Jake Berger, at least, is that again, he's going to be hitting every day in the most primetime lineup and an offense is struggling so far this year. They were a playoff team last year. He'll they'll turn it around. It's a little, a little bit of a slow start, but across 20, 2023, even with the struggles in um, Chicago, he was a he averaged over a double uh, total bases like per hit, so over a double per hit which is crazy. Like any, any player, the, the goal is to get to as close as um, as close to two total bases per hit as possible. These are the individual uh, variables that we like want to vo- focus in and um, into and like invest into when evaluating players for the entire season last year, he was a 2.07 total bases per hit with a 250 average. That's crazy. It's just he wasn't super relevant. He, he didn't get a, have a lot of hype behind him this year because he wasn't an everyday player in Chicago. So didn't have like necessarily the volume to like really like separate himself from like kind of the mediocre of the pack. He's also, if he was to get 550 at bats, which 550 at bats essentially equals out to like 500 or um, 150 of 162 games in a season. And that's kind of what I consider a full-time player, 150 out of 162 games. He would have been on a 40 home run pace. So like anyone who's on a 40 home run pace with those types of numbers, absolutely worth investing into. And again, it's not going to come super quickly, but first base is super scarce this year. And uh, Jake Berger is getting first base reps um, as a defender over um, all the, the big guy from – he went to he went to University of Texas. He's the first baseman now for um, for the Marlins. I I I don't hate him as a person. He's just not a good baseball player in my head. But he's overrated every year. He played for the Nationals. He played for the Pirates. You're probably screaming at, not screaming at your screen, but you're probably yelling at your screen. Fill in the blank. Get the. But I think I've disliked him enough through trauma that like I've blacked him out. Any but anyways. Um, Jake Berger, super, super easy investment. Of all the players on the screen, like right now, I think Jake Jake Berger is one of the most uh, easily easy to invest into, regardless of your scoring um, formats. Next on to Jaron Duran. So Jaron Duran is a uh, big prospect, like one of the, the best prospect that the Red Sox at least have in their system. Playing full time this year, he has played every game so far in the leadoff spot. It doesn't matter. He's not platooning. He's, it doesn't matter if it's a left handed pitcher, right handed pitcher. He's hitting um, every single day in that leadoff spot. Um, currently had a three point a three nineteen average, which is awesome. The thing about Duran Duran Duran, he's especially especially valuable if you play categories. Like he obviously he's not going to be available probably if you uh, if you play categories, but he last season was on pace for uh, 15 home runs, 60 plus stolen base, um, like potential essentially. So if there's, if you play a league that gives you bonus points per stolen base, like in my other league, um, I'm leading in stolen bases because I get four points per stolen base. Um, I get two and a half points per hit. So it's like those players that are individually stealing bases on their own, 
are that much more valuable. Jaron Duran is uh, is absolutely that, and just you know, like comparing him to players from the past, uh, the 2013 and uh, the 2013 and late 2000s, Jacoby Ellsbury essentially was putting up um, very very similar numbers, like so like teens. Besides his 39 and 39 season, we had 39 home runs and 39 stolen bases for one year ever. Um, Jacoby Ellsbury was like around like 15 home runs, 50 stolen bases. And with that production was an all-star and uh, got MVP votes. So that's the caliber player uh, that we can expect Duran, Duran to be if he can stay healthy and if he can like, you know, keep up his, uh, his current production. So um, I think Duran's a really, really interesting um investment just because again Jacoby Ellsbury got MVP votes with the same level of production um you know earlier this uh this century and was like a pretty notable player on to Will Benson Will Benson uh for the Cincinnati Reds he's been hitting either the two hole it seems or the nine hole depending on if it's a right-handed uh pitcher or a left-handed pitcher, but like he wanted to be, he's he's wanted wanted he's wanted to be an everyday player. He's gotten to be an everyday player this year due to TJ Friedel's injury. Um, Noviel Marte got suspended, and also somebody else got injured. Our outfield uh, was overcrowded to start the year. Um, our infield was overcrowded to start the year, and now it seems like guys are uh, sort of depending on depended to play every day because of uh the scarcity so a 225 average is kind of where he started out last year he's a slow starter but the importance of will benson kind of what i talked about earlier uh kind of in the preseason if you like look through um you know my free cheat cheat sheet that i built for everybody and figured out kind of like how to use the tabs to your advantage within the batter evaluation and the uh pitching evaluation tabs you could see that will benson was um He's a top 25 player in individual production. So just total bases and stolen bases uh, with no strikeout penalties. So he strikes out a decent amount. Top 25 player in all of 2023 um, from an individual individual production standpoint, like quality per 550 at bats. So again, if I limited everyone to 550 at bats, uh, Will Benson was a top 25 player. That's that's notable given that only 4.9% of people own him. So again, if you're in a league that does not give you a negative one points uh, per strikeout, this is a huge value to you. And I really like, I would consider making room for him because uh, last year he was a 280 hitter and um, really carried the reds towards the end of the year. He's got a ton of power. He supers fast. Last year he was on pace to hit 22 home runs and 37 stolen bases, which would be again, incredible for a player that was undrafted and 4.9% rostered. Now Zach, Galoff, um, huge on Zach Galoff. Uh, most times I grabbed Marcus Simeon in my first draft to use him as bait to trade for actually who, who I actually wanted, which was Spencer Strider. And unfortunately, the uh, beautiful mustache man from Atlanta, well, actually from Columbus, Ohio, but uh, plays for Atlanta, not playing the rest of the year. Unfortunate loss. But um, Zach Galoff being a uh, top 10 second baseman for – Absolutely no value at the end of the draft. He's only owned in 30% of leagues. He's lost percentage. He started off a little slow, but it's one of those situations where um, like Mark, not Mark Reynolds, Brian Reynolds with the like Pittsburgh Pirates I've talked about throughout the years. I love Brian Reynolds, but like when he's the only threat in the offensive lineup at the two hole or the three hole, it's pretty easy to pitch around him and like not fear kind of like what's in front or what's behind to uh, mitigate risk and damage as a, as a, as a def- defensive team. So Zach Galoff um, is like absolutely worth owning. He's my second baseman across every uh, fancy baseball format that I could possibly have. He's still hit. So he's hitting 333 over the last week, actually now 389. Over the last week, he's averaging 1.78 total bases per hit. So almost, 180% of a double per hit. Um, and he is like, again, one of the only significant threats in the Oakland lineup, but when it comes to Oakland infielders, they beat the brakes off of them. I talked about this before, like the importance of understanding the tendencies from a money and business perspective for each team. Um, Zach Aloff in his super young, like young portion of his career, this is his, uh, he played half the season last year. This year will be his like full full time season. He very well could play 
162 out of 162 games like they made um, Matt Olson play. Uh, Matt Chapman, Marcus Simeon, um, even Jed Lowry is kind of like a utility guy, played every single day. So expect Zach Aloff to do that because, again, the overall concept is like later when he comes back, he hits arbitration. <laughs> They're looking to trade for prospects coming back in. Zach Aloff is going to be more valuable um, as a trade piece moving forward. So uh, to the athletic. So he's going to play every single day. Um, so yeah, uh, Zach Aloff, I think is a pretty easy investment. Um, he's one of my uh, favorite sleeper players on to Taylor Ward. I guys have been harping at you about Taylor Ward for, um, a, a multiple years at this point. Last year, it was just like he, as long as he's healthy, which he's healthy right now, he is practically unstoppable. Uh, he, the, from a power perspective, he has speed and enough speed to steal bases. The the Angels last season had they were top ten in all of uh, offensive production last year and missed the playoffs by a mile just because they're the most unlucky team in baseball. Taylor Ward always injures himself in the field, literally like running into a wall. It seems like that's every every single time he hurts himself, he's running into a wall. He's no longer relied relied upon to play center field every day. He's playing a corner outfield positions. Ideally, if he can stay healthy, um, he is super reliable at the beginning of the year when he's healthy. Um, he's at a free 10 average right now. I just went to the third floor. And I made this like a couple hours ago. I think it just updated. Um, he's averaging 1.85 total bases per hit. So 185% of a double per hit, which is incredible. He's hitting the four hole behind Mike Trout every single day. And again, he's on a deceptively good offense. So though Shohei Otani is not there anymore. Um, and Sho Shohei Otani is, I think, like he, last year is the number one most productive, individually productive uh, batter in baseball behind um, Aaron Judge, but actually had the qual like the, the vol volume to really qualify. Taylor Ward's actually like absolutely worth the investment. Um, I just didn't. I, I wasn't able to get him. I was grabbing pitchers at that time. And anyways, he's not on my team, but I wish he was. He's always been um, one of my guys that I've really harped on. So on to Colt Keith, this is just somebody like, this is not a player I'm saying to go out and add right now, but just understand the context of Colt Keith. Uh, he was the, he is the everyday five hole second baseman for Detroit. He, before he played a major league game, he signed a six-year, $82 million contract with Detroit because he is the best offensive product, uh, or sorry, project, sorry, prospect that Detroit has had in a very, very long time. So better than Spencer Torkelson, better than Riley Green. These players that were top five um, overall prospects like themselves coming up into the league, Colt Keith is like supposed to be the best offensive, again, prospect that they've had. So just be patient with him. If you do own him, if you're one of these 12% of people, um, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't hate you and I wouldn't shame you if you decided to drop him now, but just understand that like, this is someone you need to like absolutely have on your watch list so that when he does pick up, when he does start, um, you know, heating up, he has the, the ceiling potential to be a top five hitter, especially at that second base position. Obviously he's like also eligible at third base, but this is somebody again, that's going to hit every single day in the five hole with Detroit and has all of the, uh, uh, the leash in the world. They're going to let him play regardless of how he does, how poor he does this year. They're going to let him play every day. He hasn't been hitting for any extra base hits yet, but um, the home runs, the extra base hits are going to come. So just keep an eye on Colt Keith. And the next, um, we I, I very well, like I, I often overlook the value of having everyday players. I, <clears throat> From a batting perspective, I always make sure that we have everyday players. When I say everyday players, I'm saying like 150 games have 162. To me, is an everyday player from a fantasy baseball perspective. But Ryan Mountcastle is just one of those guys that's just always there. Does his numbers and his his metrics like jump off the screen, jump off the page? No. And he, though he's starting out this year with a 290 average, and 1.8 total bases per hit, which is, inc again, incredible. Um, that's not super sustainable. We expect him to be more of like a 275 hitter with probably like 100, like 1 1.6 to 1.7 total bases per hit. But what's been consistent is that he's really the only like first baseman on ro on roster besides Ryan O'Hearn 
Ryan O'Hearn's been mostly in the DH spot. Ryan, Ryan Mountcastle has been hitting the four hole of one of the best offenses in baseball being the Baltimore Orioles, who actually just added Jackson Holiday, the number one prospect in all of baseball, to their roster like this evening. He has, they haven't done it officially, so we don't know who's getting sent, sent down. My guess would be like Tony Kemp. But Ryan's <clears throat> Ryan Mountcastle, it literally plays every single day in the four hole of one of the best offenses in baseball. So though, again, he's not a speed threat on the base paths, but from a, like a, a raw talent perspective around him, um, he's going to greatly benefit. That ob- obviously makes him a little more of a dependent player, but given how shallow the first base position is this year, um, I just think that a 21% owned, he's a pretty good investment um, to uh, find a spot on your team you know, to, to roster him in some way, just because he has so much talent around him. Again, he plays literally every single day. So something to consider, not pushing Ryan Mac- Mountcastle down your throat. Again, overall, from an t- individual talent perspective, a little more dependent, but he just has so much talent around him. Their, their offense scores so many points. Um, it's it's similar to like having a Nathaniel Lowe in the middle of the Texas lineup when they're fully healthy. And like he's like more productive than the average bear with average bear talent because everyone around him is just that good. So um, on to pitchers. Well, actually, um, just wanted to illustrate the batting lineup for Baltimore in the way that uh, Ryan Mountcastle at the, uh, not the four spot, the five spot, first base. So between f- between the f- five spot and the three spot every single day, regardless of um, right-handed or left-handed pitching. And obviously uh, Jackson Holiday being brought up, all of their big prospects that they're looking to uh, bring up and manage or whatever are none of them are corner infielders or all middle infielders and, and outfielders. So Ryan Mountcastle's spot is uh, is guaranteed, not platooning. So anyways, I think a pretty good investment if you're in need of a first baseman, which I'm sure a lot of you missed out on the first base if you didn't get um, one in the first couple of rounds because after Pete Alonzo, essentially they were they were gone. And then, oh boy, am I going to get super uh, – I don't know what the right word is, uh, illustrated, or super um, excited about Tanner Hawk. Is it, essentially, is this gonna fi- is he finally going to put it together? And of course, as he finally puts it together, um, he has a couple incredible games while I'm gone and out of town. I'm not able to check my phone, um, look at anything fantasy baseball. I missed out on him. 38% uh, owned or like increased just over the last week. 49% owned overall. Until I've been telling you guys since 2022 that Tanner Hawk I thought was going to be my uh, uh, my breakout my breakout performer essentially like my first my first player that I was really really pumping really really pushing was Tanner Hawk before um, he ended up being just more of like a bullpen guy and he decided not to take the COVID vaccine which kept him out of the starting like pitching rotation consistently as they go to Toronto and like in New York whatever so he like, couldn't play anyone in the division essentially his rookie year as he finally gets to be one of the most talented pitchers on that rotation. That's water on the bridge at this point. Um, Tanner consistently has a, a plus K per nine. That's great. We always look, we're always looking for stri- players who are getting more strikeouts than innings pitched. That's consistent, but also he's consistently really good with his whip. So he's not giving up hardly any walks and that's been consistent across his entire career. So, um, he gives up some hits last year. He was getting like hit. He was getting hit hard, but he's still not walking anyone. So the concept of getting a player who has a, a high strikeout rate with a low whip as well is so important because that speaks to the amount of movement that they have that they have control of, sort of thing. So if you think of like a Nick Pavetta, Nick Pavetta always has a crazy strikeout rate, but his whip is always crazy high too, which makes him unownable because he's walking people left and right. Same thing with like Dylan Cease's problem last year. Big Dylan Cease fan, but like he, I think every year, even his Cy Young Award year, uh, here's like he was finished second in the Cy Young for the AL like that one year. I think that he was still second or third in all of the AL, all of the AL and walks uh, given up. So to get a player who has a plus strikeout rate and a great whip across his career um, is super duper important. And that's been the case for Tanner Hawk. So if he's available at 49%, um, I'm pretty darn confident that's a good person to invest into. Um, he ha- they have to let the reins off, and especially again with Nick Pavetta 
uh, getting hurt today and out for the season, like even more, uh, le- even more leaning on um, Tanner Hawk in that big market that is Boston. Um, they're going to trade at the de- trade at the deadline for assets every year moving forward because they're a big a- they're they're again they're a big market. They don't have the talent to go to the playoffs per se, but like from a management perspective, it's again knowing the ownership and like how obsessed they are about succeeding this year and every year. No such thing as ever like uh, in Boston. There's no such thing as ever like sacrificing now for the future. It's how can we get as many wins today because the fan base goes crazy because they have so much money and whatever. So on to Michael Waka. Michael Waka is uh, kind of like a lesser version of Tanner Hawk in the way of like not as many strikeouts, but the Kansas city Royals, whatever, whatever they're drinking in the water, whatever they're doing, the, they lead major league baseball right now as a team and ERA and whip and Michael Walker is obviously a, a big part of that across Michael Walker's career. Again, like not a big strikeout guy, usually even. So that's always acceptable. If we have a pitcher who's like either say if he has 90, that's not a good example. If he has 150 strikeouts, we always want to see more, more. If he has 150 innings pitched, we always want to see more than 150 strikeouts. Michael Walk is always between like 145 and 155. That's just what he is. Throughout his career, we learn to accept that because he's always relevant because his uh, his whip. He doesn't walk people. He doesn't give up a lot of hits. He's not popping off the screen uh, from a talent perspective. And especially since he's been around for a while um, later into his career and also on the Kansas City Royals, not like the sexiest pick. But if you're just looking for a player to get you consistent positive points, I think Michael Walk is a pretty, pretty safe bet. And like from an athletic perspective, if you look across the Kansas City Royals roster, um, I mean, they're they're going to be fast. They're going to be powerful. Uh, they were super injured all of last year. So it's not silly to say that like the Kansas city Royals uh, who are currently a winning baseball team, they're six and four um, can be more reliable from an offensive perspective because they're actually coming into this year fully healthy, which seems to be the problem with really everybody. Everybody's hurt. So uh, the next one is Zach Littell and Zach Littell is only owned in uh, 18% of leagues across ESPN. And my computer is acting Really, really slow. Um, does Zach Cattell's numbers like pop off of the screen? No, but the thing with um, Tampa Bay Rays pitchers is that uh, there was actually a, a quote this past year um, with the – I don't think that it was – it might have been Aaron Savali. Aaron Savali uh, got traded from the um, the Indians to the – I'm sorry, the Cleveland Guardians to um, the Tampa Bay Rays, and his ERA dropped a whole – like, like two points. So like, what did you do differently? What does Tampa Bay do differently? And he basically just said like, how Tampa Bay teaches their pitchers is essentially like, you have movement, you have stuff, throw it right down the middle. Our catchers are going to do the rest. So the Tampa Bay Rays essentially like don't put a lot of value into having an offensively productive catcher, but they always have a crazy good defensive produ- defensive catcher they tell their pitchers that have movement that have stuff Tampa Bay Rays always one of the most team team wide has one of the most um yep again productive uh starting pitching rotations and, and bullpens in baseball every single year they're always competitive because they're pitching if you have stuff throw it literally right down the middle it's going to move and ideally you're not paying the corners on purpose if you're looking to like throw a ball pitch a ball with movement to hit a corner your variance and possibility of like missing that and and basically walking people is a lot higher. But if you're throwing your ball essentially with movement straight down the middle um, so that it's hitting the strike zone, essentially you're like going to be a lot more efficient. You're making your defense work. But again, Tampa Bay has one of the most athletic defenses every single year for that exact purpose. Like they haven't figured out Zach Littell has to play. Like he has to pitch a ton. They can't really restrict him even if they wanted to uh, because of their um, their overall like lack of depth so far this year, um, that pitching staff is more injured than just about anybody. So Zach Lassell, I think is like, again, not going to jump off of the, uh, the page from like a, a 
a stuff perspective, but from a, an efficiency perspective um, so far this year, um, uh, a 0 0.82 ERA and a one whip is more than credible and more than serviceable. So um, pretty easy investment if available and uh, also eligible at right or uh, relief pitcher. Next, we're going to talk about Cutter Crawford. Um, big supporter of Cutter Crawford. He was highlighted green um, for – he might have even been bolded in my uh, my preseason cheat sheet because he matches everything that we want. He has um, historically a, um, a, gr a really, really good caper nine and whip across 2023. Um, he has a limited pitch count like so far this season, but the volume is, has to increase essentially um, with Nick Pavetta being out. I kind of mentioned that age 28 year is always kind of the expected year to make a significant jump in volume. Um, 27 to 28 is like those, that number where you just, again, expect people specifically starting pitchers um, to have more of an opportunity to get past 160 innings, which if you get past 160 innings with uh, Cutter Crawford, you would expect around 180 uh, strikeouts, Again, a really good whip so far this year. So um, he has very, very good, almost elite stats to start the year. Um, but obviously, again, we're uh, we're lacking some of that volume. But again, this is kind of what you expect super early in the season. So um, only 55% owned. It's kind of a coin flip of whether or not he's available in your league. But that's a pretty, also a pretty safe bet. Um, before the season, I didn't know a thing about Jared Jones. Um, and I don't have a lot to say about him other than to start out the year on the Pittsburgh Pirates that I think have only lost like two two games, two or three games this entire season. Um, he has a 13.1K per nine and a 0 0.943 whip to begin the year. So absolutely elite stats from like a stuff perspective. He was a second round pick. So because the Pirates are always like the first, one of the first picks overall, um, he is 24 years old. He was the second round pick. So like the 31st or the 32nd pick overall in just 2022. So obviously going to have like a major like pitch restriction. I don't expect the offense in Pittsburgh to uh, stay as consistent as they have been, but their pitching is seems to be really good across the board. And um, again, these pitchers that have crazy high strikeout rates, it's the ability to go 5.2 innings and earn a double digit strikeouts is crazy that somebody to maybe invest into, especially if you have a keeper league, um, this pitcher might be something uh, is presenting things like a Tyler glass. Now early in his career, at least through these first two games, I'm not saying he's going to be Tyler glass. Now I'm just saying this is like, that's the rate in which we're kind of uh, sort of looking at. So um, definitely someone to just like keep on your watch list and to uh, again, maintain as he continues to grow in popularity, 34.5 percent owned across fantasy baseball leagues next i talked about jared or um ryan pepois pepiet however you say it i talked about him uh last video like for a long time right after that video or like the the evening of or whatever uh kind of got knocked around for uh six earned runs across only 5.2 innings pitch like that that's not super great never expect a pitcher to uh to to really succeed the first start out because like the benefits are to, the, the benefit of the doubt goes to the batters earlier in the season. Um, whereas the pitchers are still trying to like figure out um, how to work with their catchers. It's just such a finite, like particular movement that, um, you know, again, like <laughs> pitchers get better as they go throughout the year, especially the super young ones, Ryan Peppy at being uh, very young, the next start out, Six innings pitch, 11 strikeouts, um, and a 0 0.50 whip. So what I said before in the video is that um, we can depend on him traditionally for an elite whip. Like last year, he had less strikeouts and innings pitched, being Ryan Pepe when he was with the Dodgers. And he came over with the Tyler Glass now trade uh, between the Dodgers and the Rays. So he has that elite whip, and that's consistent across his entire career. but he has always shown these like upsides and like possibilities with strikeouts. So six innings pitched 11 strikeouts is crazy. Um, that's, that's literally insane. 
So if you can manage to uh, kind of hone in on that every now and then, at least like, again, maintaining um, his plus strikeout rate or his pay plus K per nine as well, then that's uh, super valuable. Individually, taking away wins and losses, just how valuable are you individually with your defense behind you? Um, uh, per inning pitched, per innings pitched, he was second in individual production across all Major League Baseball. Um, Tyreek Skubal being number one uh, from an efficiency perspective. So, Ryan Pippiot, if he's not already on your roster, I think at forty-two percent, I think he's uh, of this of this group um, that I'm looking at. That's someone who's a super easy investment, and I think would be um, more valuable than even like your eighth or ninth round um, starting pitchers that you invested into. So it all depends. He's only right. He's only relief pitcher eligible right now. So if that matters, like everyone has a different situation, but Ryan Pepiot, uh super valuable to me. And then Brandon fat, uh, Brandon fat was the number. He was the, the player minor league player of the year in 2022. Absolutely elite strikeout rate. Whip was great. Everything about him um, is absolutely stellar. But he's still so, so super young at 25 years old. Um, he's really, again, really dependable from a K-9 perspective. The, the stuff is there. Uh, just got to, like, improve sort of the control, at least from a major league perspective. But uh, yeah, Brandon Fat, someone um, that I think is going to be a top 25 pitcher, maybe even next year or the year after as he, like, starts to get some volume um, under his belt. Because the stuff is absolutely there. It's just him trying to figure out um, – like how to control. So you can already see um, so far this year across the season, he's at 1.31. He's at a 1.31 whip when we want it to be a 1.20 or less. So some things to work on, but absolutely a player uh, to keep in mind as we move forward. And then Abner Uribe, um, I don't have anything like super special to say about Abner other than uh, so far this year, he's gotten every save opportunity and when it's thought, that it was thought that it was going to be him and Joel Pamps, um, sort of like sp split squatting save opportunities. Um, I he his numbers aren't particularly crazy um, or overwhelming in any way, but he's getting the opportunities. Therefore, he's getting you know those getting the opportunities to win you fan get you fantasy points. So if you need saves, if you need a reliever, um, ideally again on your roster, you have at least three closers. I only have two closers right now because I'm still working on it. But having three closers give you the opportunity to like add starting pitchers as you go throughout the week uh, to make up some of those like uh, those points, like you know, uh, streamlining guys. Anyways, not a huge fan of uh, of Abner Uribe, but at least he's uh, he's getting all of the opportunities. And then the final guy on this list, the bonus uh, for this list particularly is Garrett Whitlock. And the same thing with kind of Garrett Whitlock and, and Tanner and Tanner Hawk. Their numbers are so similar, but they just have to stay healthy. So Garrett Whitlock, when he's been healthy, when he's in the starting rotation, and like he gets over his career, he he's in the starting rotation. He gets injured, he comes back, he rehabs, he gets put in the bullpen. He's in the bullpen, and then he like tries trying to work up back to a starting rotation spot. Gets back to the starting rotation, injured, just never like never can quite figure it out. He's a whole a fully healthy off season. In the starting rotation, Nick Pavetta being hurt, he's going to have every opportunity to hold that um, rotation spot, and we'll uh, we'll see how he, how he does. But a really good K per nine and ERA um, across his career, and so far with an acceptable WHIP. Um, so far, you know his his WHIP's been really good, only through two starts, but like an acceptable WHIP, so around one point two instead of uh, this low low one point one eight. So early in the season. But um, definitely a player to keep your eye on because he has the potential to succeed. And then my extra bonus tab over here is just talking about Ronaldo Lopez and Jordan Hicks, two guys that have transitioned from uh, full-time bullpen players. Um, neither player is, is young. Uh, they're both, like, they're not journeymen. But um, Ronaldo Lopez being a uh, White Sox, being built up to be, he had 184 innings pitched like four or five years ago with the White Sox um, transition to the bullpen because the White Sox started pitching rotation at one point was crazy good. Um, moved to the bullpen, got traded last year to the Angels and then claimed by the Guardians. 
now signed by the Atlanta Braves. And uh, how he was, he had 96 pitches tonight. So he was up to a 96 pitch count on April 9th of the baseball season. So his second time through already up to a high, super high volume, which is good. He has a good K per nine and whip so far. Um, and in this situation, he's, he's eligible for a relief pitcher and he's going to have all the run support. I usually don't like to talk about the run support because it's something's not something we can guarantee, but given that the, the Atlanta Braves offense is one of the best offenses I've seen in my entire lifetime um, in regards to offensive production, it's uh it's a little easier to invest and sort of forecast four wins with this particular player because again he has the volume so far his strikeouts and his whip are are good and good enough with a ton of backing so let's just hope that uh, Ronaldo can kind of keep it together I have him then um, well, when I keep the leagues whatever that's not not important so on to Jordan Hicks and then Jordan Hicks um, also being like a closer. Uh, bullpen guy traditionally with the St. Louis Cardinals and then the uh, getting traded to the, um, the Toronto Blue Jays this past season. Like not jumping off the page necessarily from a strikeout perspective, but the whip is really good. The ERA is really, really good. And um, he, he's already been able to go seven innings pitch even just his last start. He actually plays again um, against the uh, Washington Nationals. Both starts before were against the San Diego Padres. Uh, on kind of a under the radar, super good offense still. Um, so I think it's a pretty easy investment as well. Only 36% owned. And again, only um, eligible at relief pitcher as of right now. But, uh, you know, there's just, there's a lot of, a lot of guys on the scrap pile that um, are, are maybe worth investing into and looking into um, if you have the space. So got 51 minutes uh, for this video. I'm going to try to add chapters so that you guys are able to uh, skip through and um, get what you want out of it. But um, anywho, I look forward to talking to you soon. And uh, go Red Legs.